All yours. So my friend Sandy and her sister grew up near Clarksville, Indiana, and they've been telling me about the foss fossils that falls of the Ohio for years. So at Sandy's recommendation and Terry's recommendation, I reached out to Dr. Alan Goldstein. As a park paleontologist and interpretive naturalist, Dr. Goldstein has worked at the Falls of the Ohio State Parks Interpretive Center since it opened in January, 1994. Additionally, Dr. Goldstein has been the curator of the Gerald Troost Collection at the Louisville uh, Science Center. He has been investigating, collecting, and writing about the Illinois, Kentucky Florespar District since 1982. His articles on the Florespar District, published in 1997, won the Friends of Mineralogy paper of the year. He has also written for Mineral News and contributed to the American Mineral Treasures volume. He has published over 130 articles and periodicals, including two that won national peer awards. In addition to his professional writing, he has also published the novel, A Dragon in My Backyard. So without further rambling on my part, I am pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Alan Goldstein, presenting about the falls of the Ohio State Park. All right, well, I appreciate the introduction. Um, first thing I'm gonna say is that I feel like a doctor sometime, but I never got a PhD. So for you guys, it's honorary, but believe it or not, I've, I have done so much that I people think I have a PhD just by the volume of work that I've been doing. Um, I've also uh, been involved with the crinoid research. So here I am, somebody working at the Falls of the Ohio as a park paleontologist, but mostly as a naturalist and educator. And I have never published a paper professionally on any fossil at the Falls of the Ohio, even though, even though I've seen and found, have found uh, species that were never described. But that's because there's no coral experts out there that I've that are surviving. Everybody, everybody that I knew that was a Dohonian coral expert pretty much passed away. And again, that I knew. It's, there may be other people out there today. Um, so uh, let me just start by uh, going to the first slide, and uh, and you know, we'll do it. For, go from there. Let's see here. Okay. There it goes. So the scope of what I want to talk about tonight includes everything from, um, you know, why was the Falls of Ohio established? It's kind of an interesting story. Um, when was the falls protected? Because people have been collecting at the falls for a long, 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 long time. I think there's enough longs. Um, what actually makes up the park? Uh, the park is actually Indiana's small state park. So uh, it, there's, a lot of the falls is actually not part of the park itself. Uh, I'm going to talk about the fossil beds, uh, which is why the park exists. I'll talk a little bit about the programs we offer, specifically the geology programs. And uh, I'll talk about our collections. I've got a couple of cool pictures to show you, a couple of stories to tell as well. So I'm going to start with the why the park was established. So here's a picture of, a, of one of our summer hikes a few years ago. And we claim that the fossil beds, and so normally there's a thin layer of mud over everything, and I'll show more about that here in a bit. But uh, the fossil beds were exceptionally clean one year, so we just poured water over them, and you can see the contrast between the, the dark limestone and the white fossils. The geological significance of the Falls of Ohio is the fact that, it, first of all, it's one of the most, one of the first uh, known fossil localities uh, in North America. And the reason I can say that with some certainty is because it's the fossil beds were literally in the middle of the Ohio River and any of the first, like the fur, French, French first uh, trappers that came down in the 1600s, they had to stop at the head of the falls to figure out how to get around them. And actually the Native Americans at the time actually showed them the best routes to go. Um, the Native Americans also uh, revere the falls as and the fossils because uh, archaeological digs throughout the Ohio Valley area have found Devonian fossils associated with certain time frame burials, um, and so uh, there was the, back about eight thousand about six thousand years ago, uh, 
uh, there was a specific time period where a lot of <coughs> a lot of a lot of uh, uh, fossils were found associated with burials. The fossils are, for the most part, Middle Devonian. Uh, there's a smidgen of Lower Devonian, which I'll talk about a bit. A bit. Uh, the fossil beds are pretty unique uh, in that uh, the, on a good chunk of the fossil beds, uh, there's places where you can walk on one budding plane that essentially represents the seafloor covering several acres and that's over different places. So you can get a three-dimensional aspect of what the fossils, how they were laid out and, and, and preserved. And with the bigger ones in particular, how far apart they were and, and uh, uh, how big they grew and so forth, because the uh, larger specimens are actually all in situ. Uh, the hurricanes and tropical storms of the day, which uh, uh, cause all this uh, stirring of the uh, other fossils in, in this picture here, um, weren't strong enough to, to do a lot of damage to the biggest fossils. And so I, I call that dry snorkeling. And that you know you're kind of looking at the seafloor, but without having to put snow, but having to get wet. Um, as a naturalist, you know I have to put up with a lot of comments. People want to market the fossil beds, and you know they say, "Well, is it the oldest? No. Is it the largest? No." You know they're trying to grab onto something that uh, they can use for a sales pitch to get tourists to come. And you know, of course, the you know superlatives like the largest, oldest, biggest, whatever, you know, that's more marketable. So what I tell people, it's the most one of the most accessible. Here we have a fossil bed that covers about fourteen, about two hundred and twenty acres today, um, that is literally surrounded by a million people. Um, so it's very accessible. Unfortunately, it's also the middle of the river, which means that when the river's high, parts of the fossil beds are underwater. I already mentioned that. Dry snorkeling. I did not trademark that, but I might as well, right? So why was the park established? Well, you know, you think that somebody, you know, something as special as a as a fossil bed would people would would you would be interested in, in preserving it. But in fact, for, for most people, it was actually an obstacle because they're trying to go down the river from you know Cincinnati and points further upriver down to uh, the Mississippi River down to New Orleans over to St. Louis, and the fossil beds were in the way. Um, so for years, they were blasting and other aspects of fossil removal and rock removal. Uh, in fact, one island is literally completely blasted away uh, to make way for uh, river traffic going into the Portland Canal, which again, I'll talk about here in a bit. Um, so an effort was made early on to establish, the, to preserve the park. Um, because of the geological history and the history, which again, I'll talk more about. Um, but for all, for the most part, it fell on deaf ears. The park was also uh, uh, famous because of a fellow named George Rogers Clark, who was involved in keeping the Northwest Territories, which includes Illinois, uh, from the hands of the British. Uh, General Hamilton, based in Detroit, made a darn good effort to try to uh, open up everything north of the Ohio River to the British. Um, and people will say that <clears throat> if it wasn't for George Rogers Park, you guys would be located in Canada right now. Uh, John James Audubon, a famous artist, uh, spent three years in the Louisville area making sketches and some paintings, but mostly sketches. Uh, he actually went bankrupt uh, because his business in Portland, which is right across the river from the falls in Louisville, um, he spent so much time going over the falls and doing sketches and 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 watching birds that he actually you know his business failed because he wasn't giving it enough time effort and time and he basically ran it left town in a real hurry uh, between you know, he was there he he lived in Louisville from 1808 to 1810 and then as they say he got out of Dodge before the uh, debtors could come and throw him in prison so he ended up going to Henderson where he stayed for about ten years. So here's an example of a merganser, one of the birds. And I'm not saying for sure this was taken at the falls, but it sure looks like the falls backdrop. Uh, back in 1999, an effort began, and, and it's one of these situations where 
as the park naturalist, you know, I have to do a little bit of everything. And although my motto is, if it's if it's younger than 10,000 years, I'm not interested in it, um, you know, because that's, you know, not I'm, I'm, it's a sub fossil, right? And, but, not, you know, in 1999, uh, there was, uh, we knew that the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial was coming. And we knew that Lewis and Clark met at the Falls of Ohio in 1803 in October. Uh, so I started be beating the drum. Come on, guys, we need to do something. And so we established a committee to uh, uh, get the Bicentennial celebration going. And thankfully, it snowballed to the point where I could bail out and go back to paleontology again. And so we had a signature event, a national signature event in, in October of 2003 that, thank goodness, I had absolutely no role in. You know, I was just the catalyst and let other people do all the work. And I just said, all right, let's look, let's talk fossils. Um, in 1930, the first uh, uh, block and dam was built. Here's a construction shot from the late 20s. Um, all of the fossils being blasted, right? All the humanity of it all. Um, it was the it was called it was called Lock and Dam Forty One, and today the more recent one is the McAlpin Dam, which was actually uh, just built right on top of the uh, Lock and Dam Forty One. Um, it's a high lift dam with uh, tanner gates. The, the old dam had had uh, wickets, leak like a sieve. But it kept the fossil beds clean. I've seen, I've got pictures of the fossil beds in the 50s that look phenomenal. I mean, it's like all the corals, you could reach out and pull them out. They look so clean. And when they built this new dam in the 60s, everything got silted over. And so this is what the falls looks like today. Um, you don't see the bridge and stuff in this picture. This is looking towards the, uh, basically looking west and interpretive center. Uh, in the lower center, the uh, section of the uh, fossil beds, I don't know if you see my cursor movie or not, but this section over here is uh, where we do most of our programming. And it's about four or five acres, um, maybe more than that actually, because it curves around the, out of the site. Uh, but the total acreage when the river is really low is about 220, about 220 acres. And the thing you got to remember is that before they built the dam in the 20s, the fossil beds went all the way over to the far side and went all the way up to uh, near the 4th Street Wharf. So the original fossil beds, uh, the river dropped 26 feet over two and a half miles. And that two and a half miles was completely covered with fossils. Uh, so we're talking about probably close to 2000 acres of fossil beds. And so, Really, today only ten percent of the fossil beds are preserved. Now, the fossil this fossil bed area is obviously you know the fossil beds just don't stop you know at the edge of the river they they keep going uh, mostly to the northeast and to the east directly. Less they don't go very far south, and of course if you go west you get into younger rock, and so they're uh, the fossil beds are buried under shale and deeper and deeper. Um, and uh, there's places in Louisville that I've been collecting fossils for decades that are that are very nice specimens, solidified, three dimensional, uh, in a creek right next to my mother-in-law's condominium, and yeah, you know, perfectly legal because it's not in any protected area. Unfortunately, the outcrop is so small that I'm very uh, hesitant taking people over there because it, it's only like 15 feet wide and 300 feet long, and uh, you know, it's just not a very big place to collect fossils. So when was the falls protected? Again, as I mentioned, the place was um, beat up, abused, and used, you know, for decades, and well, actually for centuries, if you will. Um, so the protection actually started uh, very recently, uh, geologically speaking. Um, the first effort to protect it was done in the in the mid '60s by some local doctors, and they used their uh, clout with local politicians to uh, reach out to uh, federal people, including the Secretary of uh, of the Interior, who actually came and visited 
and they made they beat the the false ohio drum to say this is a great place this should be a national park because the fossil beds are so unique uh the uh national park service says nah it's too small okay so that never mind and this is a place that you know this has independence hall which is a lot smaller than most national parks are uh so they designated it as a natural the national natural landmark now i'm sure around illinois and northern illinois you're going to find places that are nnls now, there's caves around in southern indiana that promote themselves as a national natural landmark that designation did absolutely nothing to protect the fossil beds it's essentially a marketing tool and i mean they didn't even have they didn't even have a place to hang a plaque over there because if they did someone would have stolen it because of the you know the bronze or the brass or whatever so we actually got our nnl plaque back in a, in a couple of years after the uh, park opened i just called the national park service and says oh yeah we got it we got a plaque for you in storage so we they sent it to us and you know mounted on the building and we've the paints already started peeling off of it and we repainted it a couple of times um so again it's too small in 1981 the falls was established as a u.s uh, wildlife conservation area so it's actually called the falls of the ohio uh, uh national uh, conservation area and the corps of engineers actually manage it and the reason the Corps of Engineers manage it is because of the locks and dam. I mean, they already have to manage the water flow and, and boat traffic and everything else. Um, so the Corps of Engineers were, was assigned, this is a conservation area and it's uh, literally the only one in the United States that the Corps of Engineers actually manages. And in fact, the manager actually works at Tailsville Lake, which is a, a reservoir about, uh, 30 miles from the Falls of the Ohio. And so they come over, they got, we got traffic counters and we give, we send them stats and they give us information and so forth. Uh, but it's federally protected. So the fossil beds have been federally protected since 1981, but since there was nobody there to watch the fossil beds, people have been hauling off rocks, you know, between 1981 and until after the park was established and we actually built the building. That's actually the only thing that really slowed down people from taking fossils. And I can't tell you how many times I've, stop people from taking fossils standing right next to a sign that says rock and fossil collected and prohibited and they swear up swear with their hands on their bible so to speak that uh they never saw the sign okay well i don't believe them but you know who am i right so in 1987 an organization called the clarksville, clarksville riverfront foundation was established uh the falls ohio is in the town of clarksville in indiana and it was established by some of the people on the, uh, uh, you know, the town board. Uh, Clarksville is, is not a city; it's actually a town. They have not they have not become a city intentionally because they can say that they're the oldest town in the Northwest Territories. Now, other places started as cities, but they were the first. They're 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 the first town. So anyway, they developed this foundation and they started fundraising and were very successful at it. And in 1990, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources uh, State Parks said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll manage it. And so the falls became Indiana's first state park. Now, at this point, I was still working at the Science Center. Um, so I, you know, I was on a committee to help fundraise, but that was about the extent of my involvement because of my full-time job at the Science Center. And the story goes that Troy McCormick, the property manager who was hired in 1990, uh, he and the director of state parks came down, uh, met, and uh, the two funny things that happened. One was the first time our director of state parks came down, they were sitting in a car and a couple of motorcycle, motorcycles came up and did a drug exchange literally 10 feet away from them. And then another time, uh, they went out on the outer fossil beds. To sh he went to show the director how wonderful the outer fossil beds were. And the Corps of Engineers decided to open the gates. And so they got stuck out there. And they had to flag down a fisherman who, for a nominal fee, took them back over to the Indiana side. So those are some stories.
The Interpretive Center, which is the building you see right in front of you now, was uh, the groundbreaking was in September of 92. Uh, the building was uh, largely completed by the contractors in November of 1993. And I actually was hired the week that the uh, uh, contractors turned the building over to the state. So when I started working there in November of 93, um, the building was, you know, the, the inside was empty and except the only thing that was actually in there was, uh, was the office, our offices and the desks and stuff like that. Uh, so I was actually the second full-time person hired at the falls uh, in November. My, my anniversary is actually November 8th. So I'm, a, I'm on my 29th year there now. And uh, when, I, when I started, uh, you know, I, I, the joke was that, that we that we were outnumbered by spiders and centipedes and people uh, because of the you know displacing nature I suppose, and so they installed the exhibits in December and and we opened in January with partial exhibits and a temporary exhibit to fill in the other space, and the day before the exhibits were the day before our dedication it got down to like five below zero. The drain pipes froze and the building flooded. <laughs> so it was an interesting opening. And then, the, and, and you know, and so it was, you know, ah, memories, right? So let's go to the next category about what makes up the park. So here is a, uh, this shows you the outline of what we, what we call the WCA. This is the National Wildlife Conservation Area, 1,404 acres. Uh, you can see that it's you know, a high percentage of it is the Ohio River. Uh, and uh, uh, let's see here. Let me pull this down. So, so we're the falls is actually you know. Let's see if I can get my cursor to appear again. It's actually for me behind you guys. I guess I can drag you around somewhere. Here, I'll move you over here. So the park is in this area right here. I don't mean to drag everybody across the screen, but you know you got to do what you got to do. Um, and the Clark Home site, which which is. Um, a separate part of the park that's separated by private land is this area right over here. Yeah, okay, so uh, around the interpretive center, that's the area right there. So at that aerial show photograph I showed you a few minutes ago, that part of that fossil beds I was talking about was right over here. The Clark home site, as I mentioned, oh, I gave you the wrong spot. It's right over here. I should know because there's the boat ramp right there. Uh, it's the most dangerous boat ramp on the Ohio River uh, because it's right across from the gates of the dam. And they come out like this and curve over right in front of the boat ramp. And so uh, our current property manager says, you know what? He went out there fishing with one of our naturalists and thought he was going to die. And he said, we're not going to be close. We're not opening that gate. We're not going to use the boat ramp for the public anymore. It's only for fire, firefighters, emergency people. So the other part of the, the safer boat ramp actually washed out a year after they installed it. Nothing like wasting $700,000, I suppose. But, you know, you just never know about these things. Now, the fossil beds. That's the closest, nearest, dearest to my heart. So this is our old diorama uh, in the old exhibit gallery. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, we have a new exhibit gallery. Uh, this, is, this has a, a, a whole room devoted to the Devonian instead of this little nook like this one was. Um, and so I'm going to drag you back across the screen so I can see the, my text. So again, if you want to get precise, the fossil beds, the main part of the fossil beds are 393 million years old. I rounded it to 390 because, you know, if you're going to boggle somebody's mind, you might as well do it with a zero at the end of it. Um, and uh, when I started working there, I had the geological GSA time chart, you know, wallet card, which today my eyes cannot read because it's a three point font. Um, but it had it listed as, as 387 million years old at the contact between the lower Devonian and the middle Devonian. And we have that lower Devonian, middle Devonian contact on the fossil beds. Um, but it was like plus or minus 5 million years margin of error, which is a heck of a margin of error. And then in 2009, I attended a uh, conference, a paleontology conference, the National Paleontology Conference in Cincinnati. And there was actually a session where they 
uh, talked about a Ben Abet night where they had actually now had improved their technology to uh, gather zircon crystals and do the radiometric dating. And so at that at that place, which was um, the Tauga Metabetonite, the uh, age of the rocks is, is 390 million years, plus or minus a half million years. So instead of being plus or minus 5 million, it's now a half million years. And I'm estimating that the fossil beds are, because they're fairly far below, you know, 35 feet below the Tauga Metabetonite, is about 393 is a good number. But again, I, I keep the 390 just because it's, rolls off the tongue easier. The formation that the fossil beds are in is called the Jeffersonville limestone. Now, that's the name came from the fact that the fossil beds actually started in front of Jeffersonville. Today, because of the dam, the fossil beds are only found in Clarksville as far as the park is concerned. But it's called the, it was named the Jefferson limestone about 110 years ago. The fossil beds, or let's just say the Devonian in the Louisville area, uh, or if I'm going to be politically correct, the Falls area, has about 600 species of fossils. That's uh, invertebrates. There's a few vertebrates and fish. Uh, lots of, and, and about 150 species are coral. And I used to, I corresponded with uh, uh, Bill Oliver, who was the Rugos coral expert of North America, deceased now. And uh, he and I worked together just by kind of just communicating with back and forth uh, to narrow down species. And you know, Stum's book in, in 1964, 65, which is the Bible for the Falls, the Ohio area, has a lot of mistakes in it, which he corrected for me. Um, but in a nutshell, the Falls area has the greatest diversity of rugose and tabulate corals in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, with 150 species between the Jefferson limestone, uh, the Salisbury limestone, the Beechwood limestone, those formations are just absolutely packed with corals. The Jeffersonville limestone having the most. And I mentioned dry snorkeling earlier, uh, the fact that there's large flat exposures on both, the, both sides of the channel. Uh, where you can uh, see some amazing fossils. And again, I'll show you some pictures here because I'm going to break down the fossil beds in more detail here in a, in a moment. So I have always used two terms to describe the fossil beds. And uh, uh, this is the, uh, this picture here actually shows both of them. Uh, the lower fossil beds is a larger flat area. The upper fossil beds are where the trees are growing. And the lower fossil beds are um, underwater for a good chunk of the year. The upper fossil beds are actually exposed most of the year. Going to hit the wrong button there. There, there's the lower beds. So on the lower beds, there's large planar areas where you can walk and see corals that were essentially growing about the same time. The upper fossil beds was a slightly deeper water environment, so it's more. Uh, there's there's more uh, uh, fragmented fossils up there than there are on the lower fossil beds, at least varieties. The upper fossil beds has more different types of fossils. The lower fossil beds has less diversity, but bigger fossils and better preservation for the most part. So if we look at the upper fossil beds, um, this is a random picture uh, near the wheelchair ramp that we have. Um, Lots of boulders, lots of slabs, uh, lots of outcrops. Um, the river covers this. You can see the driftwood in this picture. There's a log right there. But right today, the driftwood is actually closer to the to the uh, uh, steps and there are ramp, and the fossil beds themselves are relatively clear. Although we had a uh, microburst and a thunderstorm that produced four tornadoes, small tornadoes, a Sunday morning, and a microburst took out about 50 trees in a small area of our woods, including some on the fossil beds. So uh, more rocks to be exposed, I suppose. So again, the upper fossil beds, uh, the river can literally come up, completely cover the fossil beds. There's no rocks at all exposed. That happens every year without exception. Uh, typically it doesn't last very long, You know, usually a few weeks at a time comes back, lowers down, and comes back up again. The, the um, 
uh, laprophosphids, because they're exposed like this most of the year, including in the wintertime, uh, suffer the effects of freezing and thawing. And, uh, you know, things come and go, basically. And we try to salvage stuff for putting our park collections. But, I mean, the, the crinoids and blastoids and other fossils that uh, I've got pictures of that have disappeared can make you cry. But new things pop up all the time. In fact, last week I had, we had a group of kids from different schools and one day uh, one kid found a blastoid the size of a uh, small olive, actually <laughs> size of a pinky fingernail, basically, you know, real tiny. Uh, another another a day or two later, uh, a kid found a solidified uh, high spired snail that's just unbelievably well preserved. It's going in our park collections. The blastoid is still attached to the bedrock. It's not going anywhere for a while. <clears throat> and then another kid found a big snail, again, right at the edge of a rock where it wasn't exposed last year. So things come and go. And if we can salvage it, we will, but we do not go down there with a hammer. It's, if it's in a loose rock, we'll take it. If it's not in a loose rock, it stays there. And so that's why we sometimes lose things, but we do take pictures. Jeffersonville limestone up higher, up, up at the uh, below our interpretive center, the layer is called the Bryozoan brachiopod zone. And the, the Jeffersonville limestone is actually broken up by faunal zones. Um, so you can figure out what are, what are the common fossils in the Bryozoan brachiopod zone. However, it also has blastoids. It has complete, you know, we have crinoid heads up there. Um, um, it has snails and 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 clams. Or, well, that's not snails, not so much, but clams and rostroconchs. Um, sometimes we find uh, fish bones, small fish bones. So the bryozoan brachiopod zone is is a, a pretty interesting layer. Below that is the uh, Brevispirifer zone, named after a brachiopod called Brevispirifer gregarious. And when we say gregarious, we're talking about layers that have now, over the falls area would have several billion brachiopods. Uh, most of them are single shells. One of the kids found a complete brachiopod last couple of days ago, sitting on my desk right now. The whole brevis are, you know, one in one in ten thousand basically. Uh, the silicified zone is actually due to a volcanic ash deposit, so it gives us a chance to talk about radiometric dating uh, during the Middle Devonian. Uh, New England was at volcanically active. I mentioned that. Cadillac Mountain at Acadia National Park is Middle Devonian in age. Now, obviously, granted, it's a magma chamber. It's not stuff that comes out, but, you know, it's connected to surface venting and, and ash layers and so forth. So I'm not, I'm, I don't tell people that our, this ash, this particular layer comes from, you know, Cadillac Mountain or anything. I just say that, you know, that's where the volcanoes were erupting. We were south of the equator, about 30 degrees south of the equator. And so, the prevailing winds would have been coming out of the east since we're south of the equator. And so it was perfect opportunity for this ash deposits to uh, blow over the sea and left a whole bunch of different um, um, metabentonites, you know, ash layers. And so you get these zones where, where the silica from the ash layer, the quartz, permeates the rock and creates these really interesting uh, orangish looking uh, layers or black, depending on how much it's underwater. Below that is the amphipora zone, named after Amphipora ramosa, a uh, spaghetti-like stromatoporoid. And in fact, we just uh, uh, found some extraordinary colonies uh, last fall when we went down on the fossil beds with a uh, pressure washer. I've been there 29 years and never had the opportunity to run a pressure washer on the fossil beds. And oh my goodness, the things we found. Switching to the lower fossil beds. Again, the best time, if you want to come to the falls uh, to see the fossil beds, I recommend September and October. Although you can come for digging the past, which is late uh, late August. And the reason I say it is because these fossil beds, like this picture you see right here, uh, typically August, September, October, early November is when it looks like this. Uh, that's our dry season for the Eastern United States. And uh, I mean, I've seen it low like this in May before, uh, and I've seen high water in August before. So I mean, it really it all depends on on the local climate or the, the regional climate, hurricanes, things like that that can bring water in. But uh, typical 
August, September, October, ideal months to come. But in August, it's really hot on the fossil beds. I mean, like, a, you know, put a thermometer on the rocks, it's 125 degrees. So, and there's no shade. I don't see any shade in that picture, do you? Um, so you wear a hat or take an umbrella or something like that. And so we'll do, we'll do pro programs out there unless it's in the 90s. Uh, and then we won't because it's not safe to be down there without uh, shelter. So the lower fossil beds, uh, essentially there's two parts. The coral zone has the upper and lower coral zone. And it's dominated by naturally corals. Uh, rugose and tabulate corals, which basically go from the upper, from the lower uh, ordivation up to the end of the Permian, then they become extinct. Uh, again, as you saw in my previous slide, there's a great amount of diversity. Uh, and we also have something called a stromatoporoid. Uh, sounds like an Italian sandwich, uh, but it's actually just a finely layered uh, sponge. But when it, was when it was living, it actually precipitated out calcium carbonate instead of the organic material that modern sponges use. Um, and some of the stromatoporoids and corals get fairly large. Uh, there's two parts. The upper coral zone is shallow. This is right here in this picture. Um, everything looks like it's been just churned in a blender, uh, except for it, but it, it does have some large fossils, but most of the things are all jumbled around. The lower coral zone is actually the uppermost Emsian, so it's actually the top of the early Devonian. It has deeper uh, water indications because you find three-dimensional branching corals and tube corals and other types of species, other corals that are really in three dimensional, just spectacular condition um, because the water was deep enough that the, the, the currents from the hurricanes did not shatter them. So let me show you some pictures here. So here's a picture of the upper coral zone. The rock is clean, right? Because normally it's brown. In other words, there's a thin layer of a veneer of, of, of mud. The Ohio River runs brown most of the year because of the silt it carries. Um, so we will actually, you know, often go out there just with bucket with buckets and, and water uh, from puddles and just splash around and scrub it off and splash around and get the mud off. And then when it dries, it looks like this. But when you put water on it, it looks like that. So this is actually the same set, same scene. So this coral here is this coral right here. This coral right here is that coral right there. So you can actually trace some of the same fossils. Um, now, what's interesting is you might notice that there's black material around the corals, and that black is actually dried tar. I mean, it fl flakes off. Um, if you were underneath Evansville about 3,000 feet back in the 19th century, this was the stuff that you would drill for, for oil. But here, the oil is dried out, and so you end up with this black residue. But if you go to a rock quarry and find a piece of this coral zone and whack it with a hammer, you can just smell the oil on it. So here's some examples of some big fossils. Uh, this is a four foot long solitary coral. So there's a broom for comparison. I can outstretch my arms, which don't fit in a zoom screen. Um, but I showed this coral to Bill Oliver when he was visiting a long time ago and said, is this the large horn, largest horn coral in the world? And he said, well, I wouldn't say that, but I would say it's the largest one in the Western hemisphere. So that's what I, that's what I uh, promote that as. Um, it's about yeah, three inches in diameter and four feet long. And then over the next, over Fisherman's Point, we have a branching coral colony that's eight feet wide. And if you look at it in cross section, you can see where the corals have been compressed a bit. Um, these are just a couple of the big, a couple of examples. Um, the the, the cynophyllum, these colonies here, one to three feet across, but the record I've seen is six foot across. Um, here's a, uh, well, up in Michigan, they call them Petoskey stones. Down here, we call them prismatophyllum. I mean, that's, it's not hexagonary. It's actually a different species, a different genus. But these things get, the biggest one I've seen was 11 feet across. And then we also have some um, alloporid corals, which are essentially related to Favocytes, and but they're they're separated out in the anastomosis. 
Um, and these things can get up to about a foot across. And then the last picture here, kind of a funny looking, looks like these uh, are like artistic patterns in the rocks. This is actually part of a Favacetes, branching Favacetes coral that I've measured 50 feet across. So long wise, it goes 50 feet. One side, it disappears into the rocks. The next side, it's eroded away. So we only have, we don't have the entire three-dimensional aspect of it. We just have the length and width for the most part. Uh, here's a Favocytes coral. You know, we call them honeycomb corals. It's 15 feet across. It looks like a little volcano, actually. And then here's another part of that 50-foot coral where you can see uh, the outside of the colonies are partially silicified, you know, replaced by quartz. And so they, if you, if you clean them off, they're actually very, very wide inside. And with a little luck, we're supposed to get a, we have a uh, firefighting unit at Charlestown State Park, which is our sister property. Our plan this summer is to bring the Polaris over. It's got a, with a firefighting package, we can actually pump water from the river into the, into a tank and then attach the pressure washer and with a little bit of luck, we'll come out, be able to come out on the right at the edge of the river with a pressure washer and clean these fossil beds out here, which have, you know, haven't been cleaned since the 50s. Uh, so it'll be pretty interesting to see what happens. The upper fossil beds, uh, this is that silicified zone, the brevis reifer zone. Uh, my foot for scale, there's snails here, 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 here. That, I think, is a clam. Um, it's all replaced with quartz. When you get the sun shining on this location, it's just my one of my naturalists call it the jewel box. Uh, this is a, a, a in the uh, bryozoan brachiopod zone, just a very dense area of crinoid columns and stems and stuff. And then uh, not far from where the uh, snail is is this large uh, film colony. It's about three feet across. I mentioned that we had been pressure washing the fossil beds. Um, so we have enough hose to go about 500 feet. And, uh, it, you know, we have that we can, the pressure washer unit is actually gas powered. So we can, we have, you know, we can, we have about 25 or 30 feet where we can run this hose from, from the machine. And unfortunately being gasoline powered is pretty noisy. But on the other hand, it attracts a lot of attention. <laughs> People are wanting to know what we're doing. So we have a chance to talk to them about the fossil beds. So it's our goal to um, get back down there and continue the process of uh, cleaning up the, we found fossils that have literally never been seen before because of the way the, the rate of the erosion rate of the rocks. Um, I mean, I've been here 29 years and there were places that were cleaned 29 years ago that have disappeared and I cleaned them back out again. And it's just, oh man, alive. it was so much fun. Um, here, for example, is a place we cleaned that I've literally walked on maybe thousands of times. And here's a trilobite tail right there, and another trilobite tail right there. And I mean, we were literally walking on it over and over again. The rock, see, the, the, the rock was actually black from air pollution. And so we peeled that black layer off with the pressure washer. And, you know, we sat, just found all sorts of cool stuff. Program wise, um, you know, our meat and potatoes is public and school programming. Uh, we don't have a campsite on our place. Uh, we're a day park. We're open nine to five, uh, uh, Monday through Saturday, one to five on Sundays, except in the summertime. We're actually getting ready to close our building uh, next week for uh, four months because they're uh, we're completely replacing the HVAC. So if you want to come and go through, go through exhibit galleries this year, uh, save your field trip till uh, sometime in October or early November, because I mean, we'll be doing programs weekly, weekend programs, but the no indoor restrooms or or anything like that. So it's going to be uh, pretty primitive. Um, we've had over 150,000 students visit in the last 29 years, um, and we offer weekend hikes. And actually, we're going to be doing some weekday hikes this year as well. But basically, Memorial Day weekend through late October. And then we have special events like Digging the Past. Um, I do a program like uh, the Family Nature Club. Uh, we do a junior ranger program with Lewis and Clark through the National Park Service. Uh, I have a, my assistant is an artist. So he, we do a monthly art at the falls. 
and then I do meet the paleontologist there as if there I am on the in the picture there with and, and I've been doing that since 2015 and trying to come up with a different topic every month for for eight years has been challenging um, and I'm not gonna say that I haven't duplicated because I know I have but it's I, I I try to be as creative as possible so I mean I'll do you know shells one time and uh, scavengers one time and carnivores one time and fish one time and plants one time and I mean you, you know I try to do as many different things as I can. I mentioned digging the past. Um, it's our big geology archaeology uh, pro event. It's Saturday before Labor Day weekend. So again, you're welcome to come down for a field trip for that. <coughs> we have three collecting piles. Um, which we keep up year round. And so people dig at them virtually every day that they're not covered over with snow or frozen into a brick. Um, but we have Waldron Shale, uh, Devonian residual fossils from uh, Salisbury Quarry, and a mineral pile. I used to get minerals from, from uh, Hasties at Cave and Rock, um, but that disappeared about a, a number of years ago. And so now we're, I'm working on Steve Garza's mineral collection, and he's got a lot, he's got about a million specimens. and and there's a lot of junk in there. And so I just salvage some of the junk. And, and the day before they, the, sh the event, we go in there and, and add stuff or we'll get a, you know, we'll get a dump truck of uh, Waldron from the Salisbury Quarry, uh, drop a load, you know, sometimes we'll drop two 32 ton uh, dump truck loads. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, people find cystoids and crinoids and, you know, everything else that you know, Waldron's famous for around here. Um, we also do hourly and outer fossil bed hikes for digging the past. So we go out on the outer, on the far side of the channel. Uh, we like to boast, I boast that we're the only state park in Indiana that offers out of state tours. Because literally, if you go out to the edge of the river, you're actually in Kentucky. And then, and then we also can do some archeological activities and partner with one of the local archeological societies. And then the Indiana Geological Survey comes and, and IMI used to come, but they haven't been in the last five or six years. Then I do a paleontology camp. Uh, this is a career camp for, for kids. Uh, I do, I've been doing it for over 25 years, every July. Um, 10 families, although some years like this year and last year, I think we got 11 families. Um, I had a family, uh, uh, you know, uh, they've, we've got them from probably more than half the country. Uh, this year, for example, we have our new state is Arkansas. We never had anybody from Arkansas, but we have them Ohio and Illinois. We got a bunch from this year. We have nobody from Indiana, for example. Uh, last year, we had a kid from the uh, Comoros Islands, which is over near Madagascar. So that was our that was our farthest visitor. Uh, we do. Uh, we talked about about, you know, what to take in high school. How to select a university if you want to be a paleontologist. We take them field collecting. We spend a lot of time back identifying fossils, and and they can take whatever they find in the field since it's not at the falls back to back home with them. So you know, this year right now we're at seven states, but I mean, but I've heard we've got one more person who was on reserve who they forgot about, and so we may have eleven people this year. So maybe another state. And I mentioned the Comoro silence. Uh, the father of the kid sent me, had some pictures of a coelacanth that had just been caught like a couple, about a month before. So I've got some fresh, uh, last year fresh, coelacanth pictures. Finally, or nearly finally, uh, collections, we're one of the only state parks in Indiana that has, that started with collections in mind uh, because the fossil beds are protected. You know, we're not supposed to be taking fossils out of the National Wildlife Conservation Area. So we just take them to our collections for them. And we've gotten donations over the year. This is part of the younger collection. Uh, but Ian, you know, I mean, right now on my desk, I've got a brevis spirifer, a snail, a complete roster conch, and a phenomenal uh, trilobite that I'll show you a picture of here in just a second. It was found last week. I mean, just unbelievable. Uh, so we have about 2,000 fossils. Uh, I'm retiring in about two years. And my goal is to have a website up with the entire collections, fossils, archaeology, everything we got uh, accessible as a searchable database. And it's going to be photograph based. So 
I've looked at a bunch of uh, museum websites with databases for collections, and they're pathetic um, as far as trying to identify stuff. Um, and so again, we, we preserve anything that's worth salvaging, which is about 1% of what we find. We also have a small river mussel collection, which is actually Ohio and Mississippi Valley. And we have a pretty good, we have three large um, projectile point collections and bone fish hooks and so forth. Um, I think we have the largest bone fish hook collection in Indiana. And we also have a lot of photographs and uh, even more now because uh, somebody just donated uh, now 50 pounds of photographs, let's just say of the falls from the 50s or well, let's say the last hundred years. And it's sort of miscellaneous artifacts. So for example, this is a trial bite, which is on display in odontocephalus that was found in 1997 by a fourth grader. Uh, Tom Johnson uh, prepared it. He's a fellow in Ohio that did trial bite, does, did or does, I haven't talked to him in ages, trial bite preparation. Uh, here's a dilatocrinus that was found probably by me below the fossil beds. Uh, here's a Eliacrinus, one of the blastoids, the morning blastoids. Like I said, we just, a kid just found one last week. It's not still a small one, not smaller than that one, uh, on our fossil beds. Replaces the small one that disappeared about two years ago. Uh, here's a snail covered with quartz that was actually in our original exhibits. Uh, here's a uh, colonial coral, which we actually put in acid to dissolve some of the limestone. It was a boulder of limestone. Uh, but I could tell the coral was solidified. Uh, here's a what we call a wasp nest coral. Pleurodictium is a scientific name. And these things get up to about three feet across, but solidified, uh, this is a pretty good size specimen. And this was found about a week ago. Uh, you know, it's a dontocephalus. It was, the rock, as you can see, there's a metric scale at the top. So it's a small piece of rock, and we're missing just a small piece of the pygidium. Uh, but I mean, this is a wonderful specimen. It's found by a fourth grader. You know, they were running rampant down on the fossil beds, and they brought that over to one of the one of my seasonal naturalists. Says, "What is this?" And and, and I think uh, Nick's eyes just got popped out of his head. Um, he doesn't know a lot about fossils, but he knows about trilobites. So uh, that's again, we're just uh, we we're. When people find stuff like that on the fossil beds, we want them to give it to us for preservation. So that's it. That's kind of the Falls, the Ohio story. And uh, we encourage people to come and uh, visit. Uh, again, I'm sorry that our visitor center will be closed for four months, but, uh, you know, when we reopen, we'll have uh, new lighting, better air conditioning and heating that hopefully will work, um, and LED lights and uh, they're actually replacing the sprinkler system because the uh, current one, the company that made it does, doesn't exist anymore. And all the replacement parts are, there's no replacement parts. So they've got to completely replace the sprinkler system. So, you know, they they basically buffered it closure time before, to account for stuff like that. So, oh no, it's a great place to see sunsets. So i um, open up to questions and uh, thank you for listening. I have a question. I have a question. You think the river will recover in a few years? You know, right back we used to before European came. I'm not sure I understood your question. Uh, do you think the river will come back the right back to what it once was before European came? No, because the dam is in the way. But if without the people, it will recover, right? Well, as long as the dam is there, the fossil beds are going to be only partially exposed. You know, I mean, uh, you know, uh, so basically uh, million, hundreds of thousands of rocks have been moved out of the fossil beds since they were known, both for construction purposes, both to make you know, room for steamboats and so forth. Um, again, remember, the fossil beds were not protected legally until 1981. And Louisville was established in 1778. And of course, people have been living in the area even before then. So the fossil beds will never be what they used to be. But the best we can do right now is to keep people from stealing more fossils 
going out there with pressure washer and cleaning them, knowing that the river is going to carry silt and cover them over again. I have a question. Um, yeah. Since the fossils obviously, um, um, it changes and some of them end up going downstream. Is there a spot downstream where there's some good collection areas? Believe it or not, <laughs> at the other end of the fossil beds is the New Albany Shale, which of course doesn't have any, I mean, you know, it's, it's you know, not large, essentially non-fossiliferous. Um, and because the river is channelized, um, the, you know, the, the river is high enough that any rocks that wash down the river are likely to end up in the middle of the channel, so they'll stay underwater. And if you go down the river far enough, uh, where they might get washed out, but by the, you know, it's limestone. It doesn't take long for pieces of rock like that to be tumbled and smooth and so forth. So, you know, you think it maybe find something like a Toski stone type preservation down river, but I have never heard of a single person ever finding a fossil down the river on the, you know, on the walk in the riverbank or anything like that. So you don't have people doing diving into that area? No, no. I mean, uh, got to remember the river is very silted. Yeah, there's a lot of silt in it. And, you know, I mean, the fact is, is that, is that this lower section, you know, the, the lower section, um, it, it, it's kind of being worn down. It, I mean, yes, there's some breakage and some vandalism that caused the rocks to break. Um, but in the channel, for example, let me see if I can get my mouse to, to work here. So like right here, or my mat where my mat my, my cursor is moving, there's actually a canyon that is like 30 feet deep, right in this area here. Um, I've actually got a topographic map of the of the floor of the river, um, which we've used in when people have drowned here before, so that divers can look and get an idea of what the what the depths are and so forth. Um, there's a lot of karst topography on the bottom of the river. I mean, I've heard. One of the one of the one time we were they were looking for somebody, uh, one of, one of the guys was diving and they found a sixty foot hole in the rock that was like four feet in diameter. So it'd be like a pit in a cave, four feet wide, sixty feet deep, wow. and with little wearing out areas on the sides. And he he said that's you know he said he's not trained to be a cave diver, so I mean he he couldn't he couldn't do much. So there's plenty of nooks and crannies that are way deep in there. That rocks could fall into and would never fall out of. <laughs> That's interesting. What was that uh, one trilobite that was found by a fourth grader again? That Adontis, was incredible. It's called Odontocephalus. Yeah. I've, I've never seen that before. Believe it or not, that's the third one, fourth one that I've seen in, in the 29 years I've been here. And we actually had one. That was not very, I mean, most of them are fairly weathered. Um, in fact, uh, Mike, my assistant, actually found a mold of almost a whole dontocephalus, which I'm not even including because it's a, an impression. Um, but the funny thing is, is that, you know, if you look at just the tails and stuff, the small trilobite fragments you see, uh, you know, the, the, the most common one is actually a crassoproteus, which has the rounded tail. And then next we phacops, which has the kind of the, the short C shaped tail. But we never find them whole. I mean, I've never seen a whole one of those here ever in 29 years. But yet we've got five or six complete odonocephalus. But but they're hard to find fragments of those. I mean, we do find some, but you know, you know, but they're but for some reason that you know they're they're the ones that are whole, but they're just, you know, once every seven or eight years is not a common fossil, obviously. These layers weren't formed during any of the um, extinction events, were they? No, because the, the the closest major extinction event would have been the uh, uh, was it the Frasian Fominian, which is the Upper Devonian extinction. So it's before the car before the Mississippian. Uh, that would be in the Black Shales. So this no, um, but locally yeah, here, cool. when you go from the uh, the limestones, the only limestones through the normal shale, we're talking about a massive change in 
environment, you know, one where the oceans were one point open, you know, like the Florida Bay or the Bahamas, for example, and then all of a sudden it's a closed, uh, you know, stratified, uh, not, you know, with anoxic water at the bottom and oxygenated water at the top. So when things died and floated to the bottom, they'd be preserved, but corals and things that normally encrust the ocean floor couldn't survive because there wasn't enough oxygen. The uh, blastoid that you found, or had a picture of, what was the name of that again? It's Eleocrinus. Yep. Well, Eleocrinus vernulia. They're pretty common or widespread because I've seen some in Missouri before in the Callaway limestone. Uh, How do you spell that? Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's E L E A E. Crinus. E L E A E Crinus. Elia Crinus. It's either E L, I think I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Elia Crinus. Is there the first it was first described by Troost as Olivanites, because it looks like an olive with mm -hmm. five zippers on it. And you know, the ambulacral groups. I have seen one decade, was it not, is it not was decachisma? It's one of the pentamer type blastoids that you know has the it's, you know, a deca, decachisma or no, heteroschisma, heteroschisma. I've seen there's one on a boulder near where that snail was, but it is weathered really terribly. So it's just like a, you can barely tell it's a blastoid, but it's one of those. John, does that look like the ones that I have? It looked very really similar, didn't it? It is. Um, you mean not, not the ones from the four county quarry? No, okay. It, it isn't, you don't think? Okay. No, those things are more globular. The Eleocrinus is uh, is tall and uh, and narrow. Okay, okay. I, sh I can show you some, some if you want. I've got a couple. Okay. Yeah, I I've got some that are uh, about the size of an egg, and they're they're good sized and they're robust. So that's what yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, the largest Eleocrinus that I've seen are probably maybe an inch and a half long. Yeah. And I've never seen them any bigger than that. And the small, in fact, the one that the, the kid found last earlier, well, a couple of days ago is about, you know, maybe I'm going to switch to metric. It's probably, it's, it's maybe seven centimeters or seven millimeters across or six millimeters across. No, yeah. So it's a little fella. That's small. Yeah. Which is why we never saw it before because it was so small, but mm -hmm. it's positioned with one of the ambulacral crews right at the top. So it looks like it's a little ball with a zipper on it. You know, so it's very easy when, you know, not, and there's actually another one that I found when we were pressure washing uh, about 15 feet away from this one. And it's solidified, which is kind of weird. So you got the, and it's sticking up most of the time they're laying down. And this is sticking up like, you know, not quite straight up. And it's solidified. It's bright white. And, you know, we, we you know, and, and it was like, holy cow, how did we miss that sucker? Because it was so white. I mean, I, you know, it's possible they had some pollutants on it covering it and making it darker. But boy, when we cleaned it off, that sucker is straight. I mean, it's easy to see if you know what to look for. I don't show people most blastoids. I'll show kids because they'll never come back and they can't find them anyway. But I, typically on, a, on, on, on hikes with adults and stuff, I usually don't show them the rarest specimens because I don't want anybody to come back and whack it or try to steal or something like that. It's a good idea, Alan. And I'll show it to you guys, because I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a, another question. Um, I was involved with the, uh, when we had the Devonian Fossil Gorge uh, here in Iowa yeah. City. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was on the board that put that together and stuff. There were six of us on that. But um, it happened, I believe, in 93 and then again in 2008. Yeah, the big floods. Yeah, big floods that overtapped the spillway or overtopped the spillway. But anyhow, uh, after the 93 one and before the 2008, uh, nature seemed to start reclaiming a lot of, with a lot of weeds and uh, debris and stuff like that. Uh, right. And uh, it, after the 2008, it cleaned it again. And now it's doing the same thing uh, to the point where it's getting harder and harder to find some of the fossils and stuff uh, just because the surface is breaking up 
do you have any problem like that at, at uh, your, or is, is the river over topping it often enough that it doesn't, or? Well, that the main, the, the, you know, the lower fossil beds and the upper fossil beds suffer from different ways of erosion. Mm -hmm. So for example, on the lower fossil beds, the primary erosional cause is sand silt in the river physically wearing the rock down. And I have determined by observation that it takes, that this fossil bed right here, where I'm moving my cursor, is wearing, wearing down at about a one millimeter every 20 years. And the reason I can say that is because in, uh, in the late, in let's say 1997, a, a kid found a trial bite tail out here, about where my cursor is, that had just chipped off. It was very fresh. I mean, and it was literally just the tail. That's all it was. And then about 20 years later, you couldn't see it. You couldn't, I mean, I knew exactly where it was because of relationship with fossils around it, which are still visible. But the trial bite is literally, and I mean, it didn't happen suddenly. It was slowly disappearing. And so, you know, I said, all right, you know, now, you know, I'm, now is my end time. Like, there's no sign of it. So it took about 20 years. And that, and so we, it's about a millimeter of the, of the limestone that wore out. So the lower fossil beds are wearing, I don't know, you know, maybe that some of that clay is actually helping protect it or slow it down. But let's say, so it's, let's say five centimeters per century is what the limestone is weathering down. On the upper fossil beds, however, because you have freezing and thawing, you know, because it's exposed in most of the winter time, and it's, you know, and, and the currents on when, it, when the river's up to where it's over the upper fossil beds, it's actually, a, there's a big eddy that occurs right in this area here. And there's an eddy that actually comes right up along the shoreline and it's fast. And all the rocks that weather out on the upper fossil beds get shifted to the left upriver basically, and then dropped over the edge of the little cliff there. And so if, I'm, if, I, if there's a fossil that, I, that used to be there and I can't find it, I'll go over and, and look. We actually had a stromatoproid that disappeared a couple of weeks ago, but I think someone walked off with it, to be honest with you, because it's a, it looked like a pillow. Uh, I've been using it for 29 years. as a It's the only nice stromatoproid in the upper fossil beds. It's gone now. And in fact, uh, you know, looking around, I found a, a gigantic water snake getting ready to sh shed its skin because its eyes were milky. Um, first one of those I've seen in a long time. Um, but I did not see this, the stromatoproid. So uh, freezing and thawing, um, relatively fast. You know, it, you know, there's it, it, there's a lot of rock damage uh, by freezing and thawing, but it's also exposing new fossils literally every year. But you don't, so you don't have plants that are trying to take over. There, there is places like I'm going to get on. I'm going to use my cursor here. Here's the outer fossil, but there's a waterfall right here. There's actually willows over here, um, various and sundry water plants, okay, that like to have their feet wet. Um, and so those places have, you know, there's, they've established a foothold. And I can't say that it's expanding because I just don't go over there that often. But visually from the river, from the shoreline, you can, I mean, if it's expanding, it's expanding by inches, not very much. But, but around here, and down here, there's, you know, there's very few plants because this is the, I mean, this is the main Ohio River channel right here. This oh. is the main channel here. This is called the Indian chute. And then behind the dam now was the middle chute. And so this is the deepest and biggest part of the river. And as a result, um, the river actually does protect the fossil beds uh, from freezing and thawing and, and plant formations and stuff. On top, we get willows and other other types of of, of uh, flowering plants and uh, you know other things um, and vines and stuff like that. And so there, it's not so much that they get obscured like they do on your spillway. It's just that things grow over on top of them, grapevines and things like that. And so if we want to see them, we got to go in there with weed whackers and you know and loppers and stuff like that. Okay. But what you have, what you're talking about, is a because of the fact that it's a spillway. And it's and it's suffering from freezing and thawing, you know, and probably siltation from farming and you know dust and stuff like that landing on there. Um, you know, literally, I, I mean, if you could, if you have access to a pressure washer as a demonstration area, 
and you can get a water tank in there and just you know pressure wash an area you'll you'll you know you can keep it clean and unless you you know put some sort of a window over it like they do it in badlands national park where you know they have fossils that are preserved under these domes that's going to be a, it's a you know it's going to be it's a battle to to you know nature wants to take it over i mean there's no question about it you gotta you gotta outsmart nature is what it amounts to well they did talk at one time about in fact i let a group of uh, boy scouts in there to pull weeds for quite quite a few hours and then they were going to bring down a fire truck and try and wash it but we found out that you can only do just a small percentage of what was being overtaken with weeds and stuff so right kind of gave up on that idea well my suggestion would be pick one spot and clean that spot year after year whatever is easiest for the fire truck to get to um, don't try to do the whole thing just do what you can and then you know you know to show so some you know to show people this is what the whole thing looks like but we can't fight mother nature on this but we can show this area over here we did that with a water truck and a quarry one time at the salem quarry because some 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 people found some crinoids with stalks and arms and stuff and so we came back a couple weeks later with a and they had the quarry water truck and they we did we just blasted with a hose that whole area i mean just just blasted it and we found all these crinoid heads with stalks and stuff on them I mean, a lot of them had been run over by bulldozers, so they were, didn't look very good. But, you know, you could see the arms and the stalks and so forth. And so if you can pick one area, 25 by 25, for example, that's accessible and just clean that area out. Maybe it's a, maybe you can use it as a scout project. Don't just pick one demonstration area and keep up with it. And then, you know, you'll at least be able to do, have some show of where what it normally looks like, yeah. you know. But there, there are areas that are clean and stuff, yeah. But yeah. It's, but all this, a lot of the small pockets are getting kind of filled in. But that's still, a, there's enough to see. There's plenty to see yet. Okay. So one of the things that we did after the 93 and after the 2008 is <coughs> we went in there with saws and cut out some of the nicer specimens, knowing that somebody was probably going to try and break them anyhow. So they put them up in a visitor center so we did recover some some nice fossils mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah yeah usually there's enough fishermen out there that if someone goes out there with a rock hammer someone's going to tell them they can't do that <laughs> so so what is the the most exciting fossil that you have uncovered well, I mean, uh, for me, it's just, the, I mean, it's finding out, you know, I mean, there's too many things. That, I mean, I mean, let me put it this way, like the trial bite, other people find the trial bites, you know, I mean, I'll, I, I, you know, I mean, I find stuff, but, you know, it's all transient material for the most part. I mean, I've collected a bunch of stuff over the years, um, personally, that I, that's in our park collections, you know, I found some good crinoid heads and and uh, some blastoids and you know snails and just you know the, the you know good corals some really nice corals in fact we have a display called the best of the best in the exhibit gallery and some of the specimens are actually from one of the from you know cooper lane or atkins quarry but there's a number of them that that, that are that are from the falls and i collected all of them so i, I can't say that there's one particular fossil that is, you know, kid in the candy store. Which, which <laughs> flavor do you want? You know, I want them all. You know, so no, I can't. I can't tell you there's one specific fossil that I'm more proud of that I found than anything else. Good, fair enough. Uh, at this point, I'm going to stop recording, but that doesn't mean you can't. You'll have to stop qu asking questions as long as Alan's willing and able. We can go ahead and continue asking questions. Well, I've got to go to work tomorrow.